This is Nuance, and I'm Mike Scala. Of course, we're live on Facebook. Thank you for those tuning in live, as well as anyone catching us on the replay. I am Mike Scala, like I said, joined by Jay Carter, also known as Timid, the chair of BLM Tokyo and the Hip Hop MC Extraordinaire. Good morning to you, Jay. Good evening to you, uh, yeah, yeah. King, King Turkey, Turkey Sire. Um, King Turkey, right? I feel like I feel good. This could be the new look. Yeah. You know, show up in court like this. Yeah, show up in court with that and see how, you know. Absolutely. So for those wondering why I'm in this turkey ass, not only because Thanksgiving is in a couple of days, it's because today was the turkey distribution. And we gave out dozens of turkeys throughout South Queens, from the Rockaways all the way up to Woodhaven and everything in between. And in fact, it is still going on as we speak. So shout out to everyone who helped us out. It's truly been a blessing to be able to do this today. And it's something that we started a couple of years ago and it warms my heart to be able to give back this way. That's what's up. So you got, you still got turkeys to give away, huh? Yeah, we're still giving out turkeys until about eight o'clock tonight. And then I might even drop off one or two afterwards. Um, just for those who weren't able to pick up. See, we originally asked if people wanted a delivery or a pickup is when we first started doing it a couple of years back. And most people said delivery and it just got to be too much. So we really tried to get people to pick it up this time. And that's why we had multiple locations at different times to try to accommodate their schedules and their lives. But there were still some people who just couldn't get there physically. And so we want to make sure they can get their turkeys as well. And so luckily there weren't that many this time, but we are making some deliveries too. Okay, okay. So my question is, you, you said you're still giving out turkeys till about eight o'clock tonight. Uh, how about turkey hats? Are turkey hats being given Turkey out? hats? Yeah. They're not being given out. I've got a monopoly on the turkey hat. This is just my thing. I might trademark this. No one else can wear this hat but me. Okay, okay. All right. That's well, good to know. It's good to know. I think I'll pass. But uh, hand my turkey off to someone else. I was really You'll hoping. You'll on the hat or the turkey? The turkey, the turkey. I was really hoping for a turkey hat, but you know, it's all right. Oh. But that's, that's what's up. Well, that's good. Sounds like it was a, um, it's been a success this year. Uh, and, and what happens if all of the turkeys don't get picked up tonight? Are you going to be gorging on turkey for the next couple of weeks? No, absolutely not. Uh, we actually kept a pretty tight list so we know who's getting a turkey. And, you know, unfortunately, there were people who wanted turkeys and I just couldn't give them all out because then when people would come later, they would miss out. So you did have to sign up to get it. But I did mention to the community fridge, actually, in Rockaway on Beach 92nd Street, that if I had a couple extra, I think it might be like two or three extra tonight, I would drop them off there. That's what's up. That sounds good. So, I'm sure yeah, that people uh, very good. And actually, I had a quote from JFK, can't find it now, but there was a quote from JFK that I had come across, and it kind of reminded me of what this Thanksgiving season was all about. Not to sound preachy, but it was about basically the power of actions over words. Here we go. As we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. So it isn't only about saying we're grateful, expressing our gratitude in words, but living by it, showing it, you know, and to me, being able to give back is a way to do that. But also just in our lives, when it comes to friends and family, people who are important to us, you know, Thanksgiving, we kind of go through emotions sometimes and say, oh, we're grateful for everyone. But what, what does that mean? And how do we manifest that? in our lives and how can we take that spirit and apply it year round? It doesn't have to be just a Thanksgiving thing. I think Thanksgiving is a great time to remind us of that, but really we should be in that giving mood and that in that charitable or just, you know, grateful that, that gratitude. If we can express that gratitude, not just through words, but through actions all year long, I think we're doing well because in a time like this, especially, you know, it could be, it could be difficult. Now, even the turkey price has shot up through the roof this year. I mean, everything is crazy right now, but, just to have people around us who care and who show that they care goes a long way. And, you know, it's a simple gesture sometimes. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and I think people 
it, it would do well to remember that, um, you know, that spending that spending time with each other, um, especially loved ones, is going to be important. And I think it's come to it's been really highlighted these past three years with the pandemic where people were kind of separated more off more and just to remember that, you know, time moves fast and spend time with, with your loved ones. Um, I had, I've had several conversations this, you know, in this pandemic time and, you know, people are, are, are feeling, feeling it, you know, emotional loneliness, you know, even, even guys talking to guys. And I know like, you know, for guys, we don't show these things, but you know, I've had guys that shed some tears in these conversations mm -hmm. because of their feeling disconnected from everybody during the the pandemic time. So, um, you know, in times like this, especially in holidays like this, this is kind of a, a family holiday where you come together with with family or even with friends and and break bread and spend time together. Just remember to to do that during the year too, when whenever possible. You know, don't wait for a special day um just to do it you know you can get yeah. together and reach out to each other uh, at other times and that's all it is sometimes just reaching out and asking how somebody is seeing if they're okay you know it doesn't have to be this grand overture or, you know monetary expense or whatever it could just be hey you okay you're good because it reminds people that there are those who care about us and we're not alone absolutely absolutely so, so. anyway <laughs> go ahead now that said, I see uh, James in the chat saying, "What's going on? Happy Thanksgiving!" Hey James, you could have gotten a turkey in Rockway, man. We got someone in Rockway right now giving out turkeys. <laughs> so I wanted to mention. I guess it's for. I guess all the turkeys are spoken for. Yeah. Hey, get it from the fridge later. Well, we'll let you know how many are left. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I wanted to mention this Netflix docu series called Pepsi Where's My Jet, which I guess is a play on Dude Where's My Car as a title. Probably. But I found it interesting. Actually, uh, somebody texted me saying that I should watch it because it's a case that's taught in first year contracts law, law school. And I did learn about it. And it's really not that interesting of a case, really. I think, I think just like the facts behind it are funny and fascinating. I think it's kind of used as an, an introduction to the law of contracts because there isn't a whole lot of useful law there behind it. I mean, there's some stuff that we can get into, but it's just a fun case in terms of what happened. And it made for a fun docuseries about this guy who saw this commercial that Pepsi aired saying that you could redeem Pepsi points for prizes and you got them from the bottle caps. So it was a way to get people to buy more Pepsi to competing with Coke, of course. Um, the commercial was showing these, this kid and really you know, part of the argument of the case became that it was marketed towards children because it showed a kid going to high school and he had all this like Pepsi gear on, like the Pepsi hat, and the jacket, and you can get all these different Pepsi items with the points. But at the end, it showed a kid landing a fighter jet in his his schoolyard like, like the front yard of his school saying that sure beats the bus and it said seven million points on the screen seven million pepsi points gets you this fighter jet now there's no disclaimer or anything like that there's no legal language saying ha ha just kidding it doesn't apply but obviously pepsi said that it was intended to be a joke but there was a guy out there a young man he was 18 which is important he wasn't technically a kid but he was 18 he went out there and he accumulated enough pepsi points for the jet and he demanded the jet and pepsi refused to give it to him they said they were, they were just joking and they kind of were dismissive i think they offered him like two cases of pepsi or something like that he's like i don't want two cases of pepsi you want a jet and he <laughs> went you know ended up going to court and it became a whole case uh, have you heard about this ever um no i haven't heard about this um but i think it it's it's funny it's it's interesting um so first how old was the kid i think he was 18. 18 wow okay when this started and this went on for a few years i think he was 18 when this began and we went on to his 20s so did he get the jet no so that was the whole case it did go to court and first there was a venue battle and pepsi actually outmaneuvered them initially because pepsi beat them to the punch and filed suit in new york where it, they knew that it would be more friendly to their argument but the judge ended up ruling that 
no reasonable person would find that to be a serious offer. But see, what was interesting about it was that they were arguing that <laughs> a serious offer to whom? They were saying that you have to bring in members of the Pepsi generation and children because they said the commercial was clearly geared towards children. So it's one thing to say an adult wouldn't take it seriously, but would kids take it seriously? Right. Which is funny. I mean, it's a funny argument. I don't think it's the best argument because first of all, this guy was 18 himself, so he wasn't a kid. And second of all, if you're truly a kid, you can't enter into a contract anyway. I mean, your parents would have to step in and say, hey, that's a joke. You can't get the jet, right? Yeah. Um, I figured that's what you were going to say. That they were going to say there was no one would reasonably expect to receive a jet. <laughs> but, you know, they said it. And, yeah. and I mean, we just saw what? We just saw a, a lottery winning package of what, a billion dollars? Like, who would reasonably expect that you, you could just win a billion dollars from a lottery ticket? I mean, I do. I, I reasonably expect that that's a real prize, not that you have a good a chance lot. of winning it. But that but I wouldn't expect them to say, just kidding, you're not getting it if they say that that's the prize. <laughs> and you yeah. win. I don't know. I'd want my jet, my damn jet. Yeah. But it was also, it wasn't just any jet, it was a fighter jet. And then it became a whole controversy with the Pentagon getting involved and saying, well, Sidley, right. I don't have this. And that kind right. of fed into the whole idea of no person should take this seriously because a civilian can't fly around in a fighter jet. Right. Well, give me the money for the jet then. Yeah. Well, that's what it was. They were going to try to flip it. And he actually, see, the guy, found in the fine print that it wasn't just pepsi points that were that you can get from the bottle caps you could actually send it in order form with money and it had a certain monetary value so i think it was like seven hundred thousand dollars that he ended up getting an investor to write a check for to buy the points to buy the seven million points for the jet and they figured well that would be a good investment because they can buy a jet essentially for seven hundred thousand dollars and flip it for millions now see that changes the game a little bit right there like that means if he didn't just collect the points like that's He's seven hundred thousand dollars into this, so they wouldn't cash the check though. If they cashed the check, that would be a different story. They sent okay. the check back, and they said that this is not a serious offer. Okay, so so he collected the seven million in another way. Then he didn't collect the seven million. He sent in an order form saying, "I would like the jet," and included a check for seven hundred thousand dollars. Oh, okay. For the seven hundred for the seven million Pepsi points, because the catalog said that you could buy points as well like you send an order form saying what you want and you can just pay for the points to get the item okay so so they wouldn't even let him buy the points not for the no yeah because you're not buying the points just generally you're buying right. the points for an item that you specify on the order form so he right, sends right. in the order form for a jet and the check for the points and they send it back saying this is not a real offer right right but they okay. did so so they were in negotiations and actually at one point he got michael avenatti to be his lawyer Obviously, this is way pre-Trump and all that kind of stuff. But in negotiations at one point, Pepsi offered to settle for $750,000 and were even, I guess, suggesting they'll push it up to a million. The guy turned down the million dollars to go to trial and lost. So he could have gotten a million dollars out of it if he took the settlement. Uh, I would have taken the million. Yeah. Just because I realized, like, first of all, like, like I said, I wouldn't expect that I'm going to get a jet, but um, especially a fighter jet, a military fighter jet. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I would, I would take that million. In retrospect, it was certainly the right choice, but he thought he was going to go all the way with this. Um, I don't know, flip it for 30 million or something. Yeah. I mean, that's a possibility I would have taken, you know, and that would have been rough too. Like, just imagine if they're like, all right, well, here's a jet. Where do you want me to drop it off to? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny like, because initially before they realized they could buy the points, they were trying to come up with a whole scheme to even store the Pepsi. They're like, all right, we're going to buy like all the Pepsi in all the stores nationwide. We're going to have warehouses all over the country. We're going to hire people to cut out the like the labels or send the bottle cup. What do they had to do to get the points? It was going to be a whole operation like that. And, and initially they determined that it wasn't worth it because there was too much overhead. But when right. they realized they could buy the points, they're like, oh, we'll just get a rich dude to invest in this and write a check for 700000 Right. So did the, did the rich dude show up in the, in the court case? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was in. It. But he was just following what his boy wanted. I mean, it was just, and the, the Netflix special tells you the whole story of how they met. It was like, I think they were mountain climbers, but this, the rich dude was like much older than the, the kid, obviously. But I think he was like a, um, I don't know what you call it. I mean, like a guide or something like that. Like like the equivalent of like a counselor, like, like you got like a camp counselor, but I guess it's some kind of like guide who like takes you on these mountain excursions. Oh, okay, and, okay. 
So that's how they met and they were climbing mountains together and, and struck up a friendship. And the investor was like, hey, listen, whatever the kid wants to do, I got his back. Right. Uh, um, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. It kind of, kind of reminds me of um, uh, the, radio, the radio joke where um, they, they get people and they're like, okay, we're going to um, do this giveaway um do this this and this and you get a toyota and um then the, the woman i think won or whatnot and so she shows up to get a toyota and they give her a toy yoda right right i heard about that as well yeah it's like wait wait, wait what's, what's going on hey I, we said toyota but did but that so that was only said verbally right it wasn't right right it was like if it's written down is there a space between it or is it toyota or yeah, and it spelled like, differently, but it was verbally said. But it's just verbally. like a kind of a, I don't know. It's not that's a better case, though. I mean, to me, you go back to that question: How would a reasonable person interpret that? I think the reasonable person would think they were giving away a Toyota, not a Toyota. Who thinks that? Yeah, yeah, that's funny. But there was another part of the case which wasn't in the Netflix special, I guess, because it wasn't as interesting. Mm. But the case was also decided on the idea that for a contract of that value. It had to be in writing, something called the statute of frauds, and you know applies for real estate transactions, but also for very large financial transactions. And they said there was no writing here because you know normally a contract is, is just an agreement between people; it doesn't have to be writing. Like people think that a contract is just a, a piece right. of paper, but it's not. It's the agreement. The paper right. is, can be used to memorialize that agreement, right? Like to evidence the agreement, but the paper itself is not the contract. But in a case of real estate transactions or very large financial transactions, oftentimes depending on state law, you do have to have a writing of it. And there wasn't in this case. And so that was another reason why they couldn't win. Yeah. And yeah, because this, this would not be a small transaction. Right. <laughs> Crazy amount. Um, Anna Vita in the chat said, where's the turkeys at? Oh, well, they were all over the place. So we had earlier in Ozone Park, we had a location. We had a second location in Ozone Park tonight. We had one in um rockaway tonight and then we also made deliveries throughout south queen so we were all over the place but people i posted on my social media people had to register basically they just had to email me their information and i had them on my list so we knew who was getting what that's up. That's up. so uh, here's uh, interesting I, before we move on from that pepsi jet topic there was a lawsuit recently where this might have come into play. And mm. it was when Bill Maher did a segment on his show, actually, about Trump. And he said that he believed Trump was a descendant of some kind of primate. I don't know if it's an orangutan or uh, an ape. I forget what, what exactly it was. But he was joking uh, on his show that if Trump could produce his birth certificate to prove that he wasn't the offspring of a primate that he would give him a million dollars. And I guess it was a play on the whole birtherism with the Obama birth certificate thing, but it was a joke on his show. Uh, mm -hmm. Trump actually sued Bill Maher in court with a copy of his birth certificate demanding the million dollars. I would guess, I would, I would, I would bet money that they cited that case as precedent to say that no reasonable person would consider that to be a real offer. I wonder what the result of that was. It got thrown out. It, it did. I mean, yeah. I, listen. It was a joke. It was a clear joke. Listen, I, you know, I would, I could understand calling his bluff. Like, hey, yeah. all right, here's my birth certificate. Where's my money? Right, right. I can, I can totally see. But, but here's happen. a clear difference. Bill Maher is a comedian, and that was a comedy right. show. Even though it's about the news and that kind of thing, it's still a comedy show. It was for the last. The Pepsi right. commercial wasn't supposed to be comedy i mean they were saying that part of it was a joke but it's not like these are pepsi comedians right like it was on a right. stage to make the argument that it was real because they were saying you know 20 points for a t-shirt and you know like the, the other things in it were real then that last piece they said it wasn't serious but it wasn't like the whole thing was just a haha joke right yeah um i don't remember it being a case i think i remember the commercial though yeah, and then once all this started happening, they modified the commercials, and then they did put fine print underneath. I think one said, ha-ha, just kidding, and then they started upping the point value to make it impossible or make it like 
even if you bought the points, you would lose money on it, like seven billion points and that kind of thing. Right, right, right. You so. know, the guy actually, they actually, it's, it's, I think it was pretty well done. They actually went to the guy who made the commercial and he said that initially, I think it was a higher amount, but the Pepsi executive said he couldn't read the number. It was too big of a number. He's like, make it a small number, make it a small number. And so they made it a small number just for readability, just for the presentation of the commercial. Mm. And it cost them really, because this guy ended up taking them into court and everything over it. But the guy was really adamant. The, the guy who was trying to get this jet really believed that it was a serious offer. He wasn't like thinking that this was a joke and he was going to try to get one over on them. He really thought that they were offering the jet. And he said he thought millions of his peers thought the same. Mm. And he thought it was a race against everyone else to get that jet first. Right. You know, and I can see, I, mean, I guess if you're a kid, you might think that way. Now I yeah. would never think that, but maybe as a kid, I would have thought the same thing. Cause you know, we're more naive. We, we see something on TV, it looks real to us. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. That's, that's funny. Yeah. That's funny. But he didn't end up getting it and he didn't get any money. So that sucks. No. He, he well, just maybe, maybe now, I mean, maybe, maybe now he's compensated because he's on Netflix on a very popular show or docuseries. I'm sure he's paid handsomely for this. Yeah, you would think. Would, would they even, Would they have to? I mean, was he interviewed in the show? Oh, yeah. The whole thing was about him. Like, he was telling the story, basically. Oh, okay, okay. But it was a lot of people involved. It was Pepsi executives, people who made the commercial. They interviewed lawyer Michael Lavinati, like, everyone associated with this. All right. Dude, where's my jet? I might have to. You should check it out. It. Yeah. It, actually, it was more fascinating as a Netflix show than as a case in Jack Law. Yeah. I just, I think what might be funny to me is just seeing his, is listening to him talk as far mm -hmm. as believing that he was going to be able to get this jet. Yeah. Yeah. That might you know, be with different schemes. If you ever saw Seinfeld, it was like when Kramer and Newman went and got the bottle caps. They tried to drive them to Michigan because you get more money in Michigan to return the bottles. So they're like, let's get all these bottles from New York and bring them to Michigan. Right. That, that might have been inspired by this actual story because this guy says that's basically what they were doing, but on like a nationwide scale at first. So like, all right, how can we get the warehouse space and where we store all these bottles and hire the people to do it and everything? Like he was really trying to run an operation to get these points. Wow. That's funny. Yeah. What would you do with a, a jet? I'm just curious. Yeah. If you had a jet, they showed up. What would you even do? Yeah, they were talking about giving people tours. And then they're like, I think only like one person can sit in it. It's not like a an actual jet with passengers. It's a, it's a military vehicle. Yeah, yeah. So it's a fighter jet. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the commercial, it's a Harrier. A Harrier, um, yes. Jump jets. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think, yeah, I think there's only one. In, I don't know if there's a uh, like a co-pilot. Um, I don't but, think so. I think it flies kind of like a helicopter too. So you don't have to go on, like, on the runway and get the speed. Like, like, like you said, like a hover. So it just like, kind of like takes off from a standstill. Yeah. yeah, the Harriers can can take up, can take off vertically. Yeah, yeah. So definitely a cool jet, but yeah, not really wow. suitable for civilians. They did say, you know, I guess it, it would be legal if you took all the weapons and technology, all the military grade technology from it. But, you know. Right to bear arms, man. Yeah, right. So anyway, I guess speaking on that, we did a poll asking if people were encouraged or discouraged by the midterm results and got some interesting responses. In fact, someone wrote me his thoughts on the matter and had a few things to say on it that we can get into. But mm. what I found fascinating was it was split kind of down the middle Mm. More people, let's see, I had it on Instagram and on Facebook. So I pulled my archive. I believe more people on Instagram said they were encouraged, but it was pretty close still. Let's see my archive. So here we go. On Instagram, it was 57% to 43% encouraged. So, okay, a bit of a jump there, but what I found interesting on Facebook, it was more discouraged. So you average them together, it was about 50 50. But it wasn't broken down strictly along partisan lines. It wasn't like one side was encouraged, one side was discouraged. It was a mixture of both. Because I think all sides kind of have reasons to be encouraged and discouraged. And so it kind of became like 
who is looking at it from a glass half full perspective or a glass half empty perspective. Mm -hmm. So it might've been more appalled about who's an optimist and who's a pessimist, honestly, because like I said, both sides have reasons to be happy and disappointed. You know, so it wasn't that. And that's, I think, a reflection of the results not really shooting one way or another you know, in this wave election, like sometimes we become accustomed to. It was kind of a close election, right? Right. Um, we got, didn't get a lot of responses. Um, On YouTube. Right. You, well, YouTube, it, yeah, it did about one... 1200 views on it but uh there was one response that said they were encouraged by far trump mm. is toast um i don't know if i go as far as say trump is toast but um it is encouraging that uh, people you know that there wasn't this massive uh red wave um but, right. I wouldn't underestimate but at the same time you know so if you're a democrat you might be encouraged that there wasn't a massive red wave at the same time republicans won the house and then if you look at states like New York and California, you did see a relative red wave, right? These are blue states and Democrats still won, but not at the margins that they're used to. And as a result, ended up losing seats throughout the states. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, there, I, I, I agree there's some encouragement, but uh, I think we need to, um, you know, one of the responses on Instagram was cautiously encouraged, but more like relieved. Mm. I think it's a it's a good way of looking at it there. Um, so we'll see. I, I would not. I think what people shouldn't do is if they are feeling encouraged, is they should not um, underestimate Trump and the Republicans because of this. Just because there was this somewhat denial of of the rhetoric at the polls doesn't mean that you know they're not going to come back screaming rough and tough. Well, I do expect a very high turnout in 2024, especially if Trump is the nominee again. I don't think that's going to stop driving detractors of his to the polls. I and mean, I think it actually brings out a lot of Democratic voters. Democratic voters? Yeah, to vote against them. I think it also brings out a lot of uh, Republican voters to because it they're does, like, but I think it brings out hard. more anti-votes because Let's say Trump is not the nominee. Let's say it's a different Republican. I still think you can get a high Republican turnout to vote for the nominee, no matter who it is. Hmm. Like if it was DeSantis, you're still going to get a lot of Republicans saying it's time to take our country back and all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Hmm. But if Trump is the Republican nominee, you're going to get Democrats to come out in record record numbers like we've been seeing, I think. Right, right. Well, let's, let's hope. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. So I actually got a very long, probably shouldn't read this entire thing, but someone was talking about election integrity, which, mm. you know, I guess is that whole concern about voter fraud, even though really there was no evidence of it happening at a wide scale level, but right. they're talking about, I mean, honestly, some of what they're saying here is well-founded because they're talking about basically why it takes so long to get results in some of these races. And with the technology that we have, we should be able to do better, I would think. Now, of course, you have to protect. This is all, it all goes back to really election integrity. You can't just allow people to vote from their phones in, uh, in an unprotected way, right? So if you're going to do something like that, it would really need to be protected. And I'm not sure if we're comfortable with that technology at this point. But right. I think there is some merit to the idea that with all the technology that's out there right now, why is it still hard? And why does it take so long to get results? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you would think that um, we could, you know, knock this out really quickly. Yeah. Because it, um, computers could count and, and, you know, all this stuff, scanners scanning at, at high speeds and whatnot. You would think that we could do that better and faster. They say, why is modern technology that is supposed to streamline the process making it take longer than it ever did in the past? And then they requested our next poll be about voter ID to improve election integrity. I mean, I think that's that, you know, it's it's been a topic that voter ID and election integrity, but like, as you pointed out, there's, it's really a non point because it's there's no evidence of widespread voter fraud. It's uh, just like a solution in search of a problem. Right, it, it, it's a talking point that Republicans brought up 
and made it part of the mainstream conversation as if something is really happening when nothing nothing's happening um i was having so a conversation I, with someone because you know i practice election law and no no you don't <laughs> yeah sometimes i do one of my strategies that i implemented was looking at someone who signed a petition and if it was a common name you know let's say their name and their address didn't match and they were presumptively ruled to be an invalid signature well if it was a very common name i would look up all the people with that name in the state and then go through and try to find a signature that was close to what they signed on the petition and argue that that was the person because you're allowed to move and and you're supposed to put your current address on a petition so if you're registered at a different address the board of elections might presumptively consider that invalid unless you're able to then rebut that and show that that's the same voter at their new address right so the record might not match and they might be knocked off but then if i can show that the signature matches i can say okay they moved into the district so what they wrote on their petition is their new address and so it still counts and so i was having this conversation with someone about that strategy and immediately they went to voter fraud they're like so, so you're saying that's voter fraud so it's like widespread voter fraud i'm like i'm not talking about voter fraud i'm talking about matching up their signatures to prove that it's the voter but a lot of people just because of that talking point you mentioned a lot of people think that it's all it's all fraud you know it's right. like no like this is how election law works like you have to rebut the presumption that that's not a valid voter by showing that the signature matches that's just that's how the law works that's right. not fraud but people think yeah. everything is voter fraud. Like they think it's just like so inherent. It's like so prevalent in the system and it's not. Right. Uh, and even to, to, I think even discussing it though, it just, it more, it further um, legitimizes that it's a real talking point, you know, for people to, for it to be out there, even to people to discuss things like voter ID or election integrity. It's like, that means if we're talking about it, that means, oh, well, there is something wrong then. Why else would we be talking about it? It's like dignifying it. Yeah. Like why right. are we trying to solve a problem? Like if, if we're taking these steps to do something, to pass something, to implement something, it's like almost like an admission that something was a foul. Right. Right. So, yeah, it's 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 crazy what can be put into like the public public consciousness and, you know, and, and just get legs and run, you know. So and even it's been, you know, over time and time again, every time it comes up, it's like it comes out. It's proven it's not a, a real issue. Election fraud's not a real issue. And the thing is, voting is a fundamental right. And so if you're going to suppress it, if you can make it harder to vote, you have to have a damn good reason. Right. It's called strict scrutiny. Right. It's got to be mm -hmm. narrowly tailored. There's all this like legalese behind it, like narrowly tailored to meet a compelling governmental interest and least burden some way. But, you know, basically, like you have to do it in a way that meets the compelling interest which in this in this case would be preventing voter fraud but also in a way that's least burdensome like if there is a less restrictive way to do it that's the one you have to do so you can't really mess around with a fundamental right like that unless you're doing it in a way that doesn't inconvenience and burden people and that's uh, like i said the, the, the least restrictive way of meeting a compelling interest i mean you could even argue that that's not a compelling interest if there's no no proof that it's even happening right I think that's one of the, um, uh, I guess, defenses, so to speak, as far as um, the point of trying to require voter ID is that it makes it a little bit more burdensome for people to exercise their right to vote. That's a fundamental right. Like I said, you can't play around with that. Right. Yeah. And, and we shouldn't be trying to play around with those things. I think that's, you know, that really um, puts everything on like murky ground when you try to do that. And honestly, in many cases, it's too hard to vote already. Yeah. My mom had that issue. You know, she moved that long ago. And you know, her name wasn't on the rolls. And I heard I heard stories of other people going through that this year also, where the name wasn't on the rolls where it was supposed to be, or where they were notified to go vote. They went there and the name wasn't there. They had to do an affidavit ballot, and sometimes those don't get counted. So I don't know if our focus should be on making it harder to vote. I think we should make it easier to vote as long as people are doing it the right way. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, we should be doing that. So, you know, and in New York, by the way, there's also some misconceptions out there about New York. You actually do have to show ID in New York, not every time you vote, but when you first vote, they can ask you for ID. So if you sign up to vote and don't provide ID, like if you just go online and sign up, when you show up to vote that first time, they can ask you and they usually do ask you for ID then. But in subsequent elections, when you go to vote, they won't ask. I see. 
You know, I didn't have any problems voting in uh, in New York, but I got lucky. My uh, my apartment was right across the street from the mm -hmm. school, it was the voting voting place. So I'd go at like six in the morning or or something. Or actually, no, I'd go a little after because you know six in the morning people are trying to go before work. Um, so either I'd go very early before they got there, or I go like you know after that rush when there was yeah. hardly anything. There. So and I, now we have early voting as well. So usually you can find a time to go in there where there's nobody around. Right. Yeah. So yeah, we definitely should be trying to make it easier for people to get get out there and register. And not everyone can easily get ID. I mean, if you made it easier to do that, that's another story. Like if you provided every voter with ID automatically, mm. but not everyone has a government issued ID. And sometimes it's hard for people to even get to the DMV. Right. So, and then the, you know, the, the time that it takes to be at the DMV um, takes significant amounts of time away from people's day, um, especially if they've got work and they've got other obligations, it makes it difficult for them to even do that. Um, it's not open on the weekend and, you know, maybe you wouldn't want to open on the weekend. So right. it's, just, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's witch hunting. It's uh, creating a boogeyman where there's not necessarily one because they want it to be harder to vote for certain people that are voting against their interests. And that happened in Pennsylvania. I mean, it's not some wacky conspiracy theory. There was an actual elected official, I believe it was in Pennsylvania, who said they were going to pass voter ID so that a Democrat could never win the state again. Right. Yeah, it's, to me, that's, that's more the issue to me, that, that there are, the politicians and, and certain people in certain parties are attempting to subvert the voting process. I think that to me is a bigger issue. That's something that should be dealt with. Like for him to actually want to do that and even say that he's going to do that, there should be some kind of a penalty for that. You know, like I'm going to actively sabotage the vote so that, that my, my opponents can't win. The penalty would be voters voting them out, but that's hard to do when they're trying right. to make a vote. Yeah. I mean, and that's what you see in court a lot also, by the way. Like if you try to sue, everyone wants to sue over everything. And oftentimes, even if something might seem unlawful or like there's an argument to be made that it's unlawful, if it's in any way decided by politicians, oftentimes they'll say it's a political question and your remedy is to vote for, them, for someone else the next time. Right. And, and, and yeah, that's how it should work. But that that requires more people participating. And if it's hard for them to participate in a voting process, they're going to be more discouraged, and they're going to be less people participating. Right. And so then it won't work. people. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, that's what people want. Uh, certain people want to keep turnout low, so they can keep power to themselves. Yeah. Um, and you would think there'd be, again, it's the, I know it's been talked about as far as trying to implement digital voting or remote voting types of protocols. Um, and, you know, there's got to be a way to make it where it's secure and safe um, with, the, like you said, the technology that we have today. Um, but I mean, but there uh, is yeah. concern about being hacked or other yeah. countries trying to get in get in and screw at our elections and so that is right. thing that's a big of. yeah i mean how secure are our networks really absolutely and that's that's another thing when when you know because the big thing in computers is cloud services and, and cloud storage and putting all of your data and info into the cloud because it's very convenient you can access it anywhere but how often do we see these breaches where there's this information leak or these you know records are exposed and so it's like yeah how how secure can we you know is it how much can we really rely on that being uh, uninterrupted so it's, right. it's you know pretty tough george in the chat asks who won the 23rd assembly district it's still too close to call at this point no winner officially announced mm. Vladimir says it's just an excuse to admit defeat the other candidate won because they're cheating yeah you see a lot of that mm. Yeah. But that could be the poll question for the week since someone did request that we make it the poll question. Let's do it. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to predict 
<laughs> I'm going to predict for asking about voter ID that when it goes up on YouTube, if it gets the view, you know, the views that we normally get, I'm going to I'm going to predict that the answers are going to come mostly from right wing respondents. You don't think left wing respondents are going to say no, they're just going to ignore it. I think they're going to be I think the right wing respondents are going to be more aggressive in, in wanting to make sure that this voter ID thing goes through because they believe yeah. wholeheartedly that there's this conspiracy or that there's this um, problem, you know, and so I think they're going to be the ones more likely to answer with a comment. I can see that. Well, the way I think I, I huh? No, I was going to say I, was, I think like on on the the liberal side, many people would think are, are are already in the mind that this is not even a real problem, so it's not even a real question. You know what I mean? So, well, they might identify I, it as the attempt it often is. I'm not saying everyone who wants this thinks this way, but a lot of people right. pushing this do want to do it to undermine democratic turnout. So you might have people on the democratic side point that out and say, that's all that this is. Yeah, but I think, yeah, I think the motivation to answer would probably be higher on the conservative side than the liberal it's the, side. Yeah, like, like I always say, it's the negative Yelp review effect. Right, right, the, in, in that regard is what yeah. I mean. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. You know, this person also wanted me to ask about whether New York needs a top to bottom audit of their election systems. Yeah, I think they're really deep into this voter fraud type thing. Mm. But anyway, the question they wanted to ask is, uh, I guess we'll ask it the way they want to. Yeah, why not? So the poll question of the week is, do you think voter ID would improve election integrity? Good. Yeah, let's see what kind of responses we get off of that. Yes. And you know, for people answering, if, if you're watching this and you, you get that question, how? If your answer is yes, how? Well, that would depend on your perspective. I mean, I think it's obvious if you think that there's a lot of cheating going on. Yeah. Right? Yeah, but let's uh, explain yourself. Okay. But the teachers say, but don't just know, go with the thumbs up and the thumbs down. We see that too much on the YouTube. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is thumbs up and thumbs down doesn't tell us anything in regards to your answer. Right. Because uh, it could just be, you know, someone doesn't like the video. It could be, <laughs> you know, they didn't like what they didn't like the turkey hat, you know, and so they don't like the turkey hat. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, it's funny with, with the turkey hat. Um, I had a, a earlier when you were talking about yeah turkeys this year were, were more expensive and just for some reason fat joe screaming today's turkey price is or yesterday's turkey oh, price not today's turkey price just popped into my head was that in reference to the jada kiss verses yeah, yeah. when he made that yeah 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 when when jada kiss did the verses and he came yeah. out and he killed it yeah, yeah. uh yesterday's price is not today's price Yesterday's price is right. not today. I remember that. Yeah. That was a great versus battle. I didn't know Jadakiss was a student of the game in that way. And I was always a fan of him. But I didn't realize how much of an MC he was and how much he really cared about the craft of MC. Mm. Mm. That caught me off guard. I always thought of him more as a rapper, like a mixtape rapper. That's oh, yeah. a special. But he like he really, really cares about the craft. Yeah, yeah. And and you can tell like he was yeah. He was really serious. His whole team was was on point. The others were the ones they were going against were on that, like you said, just just rappers or or maybe just caught up in whatever um, hype at the yeah, moment. Yeah, I mean, even the idea of of rhyming over your lyrics that drove us crazy when we used to perform in the clubs all the time in New York City, and people would rap over their own lyrics. Yes, yes. that would drive us crazy. Yes, but I get the at the most. At the most, have some lyrics in your backups to accentuate. TV track. We call that a TV track. Right. Yeah. But not your whole verse, not your whole song lyrics and all, because then what's the point of you being there? Now, if, it's not if a performance. It, yeah. If you're impromptu and someone's in there like, hey, someone's in the building, yo, would you do this? Right. And you don't have an instrumental and, they, and you want to do a little bit of a thing. Okay, I get that. 
but to plan your whole show over your vocals, it well, just because also it's just the idea of emceeing predates recorded rapping, and so to be an MC was to hold down the party. You didn't have a, a recorded verse playing because that wasn't even a thing. You were there, you put on a beat, a, you know, a beat break and you just got busy. So it was to hold down the party. You didn't have that track playing behind you. You didn't have your vocals playing. I mean, to me that always showed a disrespect of the craft or just someone not caring about the craft of being an MC. But J.D. Kiss clearly did and he clearly knew his stuff and, and what he was doing, how to hold down that show. Right, they were they were polished. They were still yeah. on that on that grind, uh, and you and and you know it's funny. Um, not even just being an MC, as far as you know, not doing that over your vocals, but you don't see it. You don't see like like Beyonce singing over her vocals. Um, you don't see any or you know rock performers doing that over their. Sometimes vocals. at award shows now, you see people lip syncing. I think all of them these days are lip synced. I stopped watching music award shows when I think the last one I watched fully through, I think it was an MTV music award, maybe when Eminem came out and he was lip syncing over mm -hmm. his vocals. I was like, ah, oh, come on. Yeah. Now rappers are doing it. Like, and I get, I get it from the production standpoint. They're they're It's not that they're making the choice, not that the artists are making the choice right. necessarily. It's more that the production is like, okay we want we don't want any flaws we yeah, want this to they want to be perfect. in control of, of everything yeah right and so which kind of takes away that organic yep. feel and takes away some of those human moments because there could be some mistakes and hiccups and whatnot and it doesn't have to be a pristine perfect right broadcast. right it doesn't have to sound exactly like the record and there's an art to having that live energy and doing it in a show appropriate way but also keeping some resemblance to the song also right right and so it's not necessarily that i fault the artist on that um but yeah it just kind of it's a little it's a little deflating in that to watch that so yes absolutely kind of all over the place i didn't have a good segue if i was trying to think what segue can i can i do to get me from jada kiss and i'm seeing to the queens link well just do just Right. Um, or I could just have a pre-recorded message play and <laughs> ad lib over it, lip sync over it. But I want to give a shout out to Council Member Selena Brooks Powers, who was also the chair of the Transportation Committee in the City Council, because she introduced a resolution, I believe earlier today, calling upon the MTA to conduct a comprehensive environmental impact study on the liability of the proposed Queenslink project. So that's big because she represents Far Rockaway in the city council. But like I said, she's also the chair of the transportation committee. And she had concerns, not just as the council member for that one district, but as the chair of transportation. It's kind of this larger role that she is in now. And she wanted to make sure that that was a project that she should be fighting for. And it was very good to see her introduce this resolution in the city council calling on that study of the Queensland project. Right. That sounds like it's, you know, slowly but surely there's uh, getting a little bit more traction. Um, there is. And we had a very uh, encouraging meeting with the governor's office today as well. Right. And and those are the halls that you want some of this stuff to be talked about in. So Right. Right. And like I said, it's both. It's certainly within the halls of government, but it's also a public issue. And right. that's what we didn't get from the other project, the park project. That was entirely internal because I think they knew that if you opened it up to the public, the public would say, we want transportation. Right. Maybe, hear me out. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to get Jada Kiss on this. Yesterday's train isn't tomorrow's train. Is that how it goes? That's, that's fat Joe, but yeah. No, but in reference. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe that's a, you know, maybe that's a, a way to do it. I did yeah. see Styles P in... Westchester, I think, I guess it was in Yonkers, working oh, yeah. with Senator Andrea Stewart Cousins and the elected officials there. So yeah, they are getting involved in activism and politics. That's too. Yeah, that's what's up. I met Jada Kiss years back. I met him in, in probably an unlikely place. Where was that? Uh, a New York Fashion Week uh, party. Oh, I thought you could say like Trader Joe's or 
No, 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 no. Just yeah, we just kind of was just chilling. Um, I was out at one of these fashion week parties, and uh, I, I think you told me about that once. Yeah, and he seemed to be rolling like solo. Like it wasn't no one. With, there wasn't anyone with him. Yeah. Yeah, and we just kind of did talk for a few minutes and whatnot. But yeah, it was just kind of interesting. Well, shout out to everyone joining us: John, Patrick, Rocky, James, George, Vladimir. And thank you again to everyone who helped with the turkey distribution. I'm going to put up a post tonight or tomorrow about it. We got some good pictures, good stuff. You know, like I said earlier, it definitely makes me feel good to be able to do that because it can really make a difference in people's lives. And, you know, it's not even the, the turkey itself. It's just the act of giving and making people feel good, like that there are people who care, you know, looking out for them. Right. Right. Absolutely. And, and to have that, to be, to, to have that and, and them being able to have something for their family to, to, to gather around to, you know, uh, be there for their holiday is something that's that's just internally good with the family it helps bring people together yes. i think it's a good, yes it's really dope i mean turkeys probably hate you but um you know especially this one yeah i mean how how utterly destroyed it are is they callous, that, isn't it i mean and, it's like not only like, are you selling I some like game of thrones type vibes like it does feel yeah like you're really rubbing it in aren't you at this point yeah, so not only are we going to 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 sell you and eat you for Thanksgiving, but you know what? I'm going to wear a mock of your carcass on my head <laughs> uh, just for the heck of it. Yeah, I own you. You have been dominated completely. I mean, it's kind of like that's sad. Uh, it's 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 like um, I don't know, eating a, a a turkey with gravy made from turkey, like. It's like you're just being totally dominated. All turkey, everything. Yeah, you know. I mean, or or like chicken fried with eggs or something. I don't know. Like I'm gonna get you and your kids. Like I, I don't I don't care. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. It is callous. <laughs> yeah. But I actually am gonna go deliver one last turkey myself to wrap up my night. That's what's up. Sounds great. Um, you know, I'll take some cranberry sauce. Okay. You know, and um, next year, think about, let's think about uh, getting some tofurkey on the menu or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was you who brought, I was going to say people brought that up. No, it was you who brought it. It was me. It was me. <laughs> it was me. I don't even think I've had, I think I've had tofurkey like once. And just, it was just like, eh, okay. Yeah. yeah, someone wanted me to have some kind of approximated meat once, and they said it was almost as good as the original. I said, but that doesn't really do anything for me. I'll just eat the original at that point. Yeah, um, I'm not. I'm not one looking to be like, oh, I need a turkey. I need. I need a fake turkey or turkey replacement. Like, I don't just eat something else. Like, it doesn't. You know. Now, now, growing up, we did eat. Um, there was this. It was called a turkey roll. Um, but it was from the seventh Seventh Day Adventist Church because there's a lot of vegetarianism in in uh, in those church churches, and they had these products that they would put out that were vegetarian um, products, and they had the thing this this turkey roll type of thing, and it was really good. You just it was a vegetable protein type of whatever it was, um, and I remember growing up, we used to have that sometimes, you know, and you can make sandwiches and all this type of stuff with it, and so. Shout out to Stacy Fefermato, actually, the assemblywoman who's checking in. Oh, yeah, check out this picture. I actually gave out turkey in the turkey hat earlier. Well, there you go. So there you go. Um, so Jay, what is the bottom line? Oh, you're gonna throw, you're gonna hit me with the mm -hmm. bottom line. That's right. Since we can't ask the turkey, unfortunately. Um I think the bottom line is it's Thanksgiving themes. Right. And so that's what I was going to go with. And it kind of comes back to what we were talking about earlier uh, in regards to, especially in, in, in the holiday season, but we want to spread it even further is being able to, you know, give back and connect with other people uh, so that people know that people there, they care, they're not necessarily alone. 
And we, you know, time keeps moving. We want them to have these special moments. We want to be able to live in them. And we know by the past three years that, um, you know, something could happen at any moment. And so make that time for, for people in your life, people that you care about, uh, people in your community as well. Um, and just, just, you know, remember those moments are special. And then, you know, people are, can be around, people can care. So. Yes, yes. Couldn't have said it better myself. Let me take a crack then at where people can find us since you did the bottom line. Go for it. Once with Mike Scott and Jay Carter. Of course, we're on Facebook Live every week, but the replays are available on YouTube at any time. And we also have clips throughout the week posted on there. So that's Nuance with Mike Scala and Jay Carter and in audio form wherever podcasts are available. So your favorite podcast spot, again, Nuance with Mike Scala and Jay Carter. We've got Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon, wherever has this podcast up, you can find us. And we thank you all for tuning in each and every week. And happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Absolutely. Happy Thanksgiving. We'll catch you next time.